Welcome, market participants, to another Three Things in Credit. I'm Van Hesser, Chief Strategist at KBRA. Each week, we bring you three things impacting credit markets that we think you should know about. And unlike the Fed, we will not provide you with a dot plot of our views. All right, let's get started. This week, our three things are, one, consumer lending in the age of COVID. One of the industry's most insightful minds is warning about two things investors need to watch out for amidst all of this much better than expected loan loss experience. Two, the West is experiencing its worst drought in at least 20 years. You need to have this on your radar. And three, a far greater percentage of companies are in financial and or operational distress than you might realize. Having economic growth go from 10% quarterly real GDP growth in the current quarter to 3% over the next year is not likely to help. We'll tell you where to watch closely. All right, let's dig a bit deeper. Lending to consumers in the age of COVID. As analysts, we try and understand and strip out the effects of COVID on the credits we study. The hard part is not to get too caught up in what we see, because that is, here's that word again, transitory. We don't want to ignore what has happened as a result of all that fiscal and monetary relief because, just like an extraordinary gain to a company, the money, the windfall, is real. We just don't want to assume that that windfall is recurring. So we thought about this when we read the transcript this past week of a fireside chat at a Morgan Stanley conference with Capital One founder, CEO, and consumer lending visionary Rich Fairbank. And as an aside, no one over the years has done more, in my humble opinion, to illuminate and openly discuss trends in the consumer lending business than Mr. Fairbank. So when he speaks, we listen. He made two points that anyone looking at the consumer lending business should pay attention to. One, in more typical shocks, there tends to be a pull forward of consumer loan losses. Examples are when the bankruptcy law changed uh, or the Great Recession. Borrowers who are struggling financially at the time of the shock tended to charge off earlier than they otherwise would absent the event. That pull forward of losses was, in turn, typically followed by a period of extraordinarily benign loan loss experience. In COVID, the opposite is happening. Here, marginal borrowers were kept afloat via stimulus, directly through direct transfer payments and or indirectly through life support given to the companies that employed them. It's the reverse of the pull forward, Mr. Fairbank says, adding, there's probably a deferral of losses going on here. He goes on to say that Capital One has to make sure credit underwriting models don't, in his words, get faked out by what they just saw. His second point, a related one, is that there is a danger in the industry of credit scores being overinflated, where underwriting models have trouble determining credit risk, given the totally unique things we've observed in the past year. For what it's worth, Capital One is using essentially the same underwriting standards as they did pre-pandemic. Other observations he made of note, he expects business travel and the lucrative spend that happens with it will not return to pre-pandemic levels. Despite noteworthy paying down of credit card debt, he does not believe there's been a secular change in the way consumers use credit cards. He expects a return to normal in terms of spend borrow, and payment rates for one of banking's most profitable products. And scale has always mattered in the consumer lending business, and it will matter more, in his observation, in an increasingly digital world. All right, on to our second thing, the Western drought. Now, this past week, New York Times published a piece on what it called the intense drought gripping the American West, particularly the Southwest and California. Citing work from the federal government's official drought tracking service, extreme conditions are more widespread throughout the West than at any point in at least 20 years. And for those of us that like pictures, the piece provides vivid graphics showing just how bad and how pervasive all of this is. Pull up the piece dated June 11th. It's powerful. For those of you that have followed KBRA's differentiated approach to ESG, one that seeks to identify ESG factors that materially impact default risk while evaluating management's ability and willingness to manage those risks. This is potentially shaping up to be one of those risks. Record low precipitation over the past year, coupled with significantly higher temperatures, have left reservoir levels near record low levels. 
This week, in response to soaring temperatures, Californians have been asked to cut their electricity use to avoid rolling blackouts. Researchers also point out this is not just a dry, hot year. This is just the latest and most severe year in what has been 20 years of dry and much warmer conditions. With conditions, quote, as bad as it can be, unquote, according to one researcher, investors should expect another bad year for megafires following 2020, the worst year on record, and 2019, the year wildfires forced PG&E to seek bankruptcy protection. So what does this mean for credit? Well, drought reduces hydropower while boosting demand and the price customers face for gas. It increases the risk for wildfires and the costs needed to mitigate those risks. Concerns will be centered on power utilities, agribusiness, and property and casualty insurance once again. Longer-term impact on the appeal of the West, especially high-cost jurisdictions like California, will also be worth monitoring. All right, on to our third thing, hidden corporate stress. Now, we've talked in the past about the rise of zombie companies, fundamentally weak firms being kept alive by either state support or abundant liquidity. Historically, zombies have been more prevalent in Asia and Europe, where there is a far greater state ownership and influence in their corporate sectors than has been the case in the U.S. But zombies have been rising in the U.S. over the past five years or so due to abundant liquidity resulting from the long economic expansion pre-pandemic and massive global quantitative easing, which has in turn sent investors off in search of yield. The pandemic counterintuitively furthered the growth of zombies as super accommodative fiscal and monetary policy kept many firms alive, ironically by issuing more debt, that otherwise would undoubtedly have succumbed to 2020's short but sharp recession. We worry about zombies because they tend to be destructive, price-cutting competition that ultimately acts as a drag on the economy. Recent research by Boston Consulting Group put some definition around the zombie universe. According to BCG, some 22% of North American public companies were not, in their words, financially or operationally stable at the end of Q1 2021, according to the firm's Turn Radar Index, which tracks the financial and operational performance of public companies using more than 20 forward and backward-looking financial and stock market performance indicators and qualitative gauges. The good news is that the trend is our friend. That percentage has dropped from 32% on September 30th, 2020. The firm attributed the improvement to rebounding demand post the successful vaccine rollout, highly favorable financial conditions, and ongoing stimulus. According to BCG, Stressed firms are concentrated in several industries undergoing significant structural change that was hastened by the pandemic. These include media, where 38% of companies were under stress at the end of the first quarter. Fashion and luxury goods, 37%. Oil and gas, 36%. Travel and tourism, 32%. Retail, 27%. Materials and processing, 23%. These figures are anecdotal evidence of one of the key themes that we keep coming back to, and that is the speed at which basic life elements are changing, with much of the catalyst related to technology. This phenomenon is fundamental to the skills mismatch in the labor market, weakness in certain commercial real estate property types and markets, and changing consumer preferences. And it goes a long way to explaining why the Biden administration is guiding that the economic recovery will not be linear. It also reminds us of something that is consistent with Rich Fairbank's observation of what is likely to happen in the consumer lending market, that is, the pushing forward of credit losses into the economic recovery. We could see the same thing in the commercial sector when that super accommodative fiscal and monetary policies are dialed back and capitalism's creative destruction is once again allowed to run free. This is going to happen sooner than many think. According to the Bloomberg Consensus Economic Forecast for the U.S., we are at peak growth right now. In the second quarter, where real GDP growth on a quarter-over-quarter basis is expected to be 10%. A year from now, that growth rate is forecast to be 3%. Engineering a soft landing out of that downdraft is going to severely test the government's messaging skills just as campaign season heats up for 2022 midterms. It will be interesting to say the least. So 
So there you have it. Three things in credit. One, consumer lending in the age of COVID. One of the industry's most insightful minds is warning that losses have been deferred and credit underwriting models need to discount the pandemic-era loss experience. Two, the West is experiencing its worst drought in at least 20 years. This is likely to hit exposed sectors over the course of the summer. And three, a far greater percentage of companies are in financial and or operational distress than you might realize. Having economic growth go from 10% to 3% over the next year is not likely to help. As always, thanks for joining us. Don't forget to check in on KBRA.com for our latest rating reports and research. See you next week.